seeing it for the first time. I hope it will record and I can share this to you. Let's start the class. So I shared with you so far about the PCR in details, right? Uh, if you're not able to watch the videos in my previous lectures, you can um, There you go. I think you can watch my screen now. Screen is visible. My voice is visible. You are all visible. So we should initiate the class further. Then there are some uh, macromolecule uh, blotting probing techniques in which Sumande, I had shared the link already. How can I copy this? So I will share these recording also over the group. So don't worry if somebody is not able to join in. So yeah, micromolecule blotting techniques. So remember, snow. Snow drop. As for southern, and for northern, uh, W4 Western. Southern blotting, northern blotting, western blotting. Southern blotting is done to identify DNA. Northern blotting is done to identify RNA. And western blotting is done to identify protein. Yeah. So this is just, you forget this. You just remember, it's easy way to remember that what is the use of southern blotting, what is the use of northern blotting, and what is the use of western blotting. So the macromolecule blotting probing techniques, this is a genomic DNA in which we can restrict them, uh, we can digest them with the help of restriction endonucleus. We make a small particles, um, small components of our DNA, then we run over the agrose gel. And then after the separation, we transfer over the nitrocellulose membrane. Uh, nitrocellulose membrane then after transferring to the nitrocellulose membrane we probe them with the concerned uh, phosphorus radioactive phosphorus and then if there is our concerned DNA is present within that sample it will be visible then after exposing to x-ray film we can see them clearly so that's the basic principle behind your southern and northern blotting so southern blotting, it's a method for probing for the presence of specific DNA sequences within the DNA molecule. So DNA samples are separated by gel electrophoresis and then transferred to the membrane by a capillary action. The membrane is then exposed to labeled DNA probe that has a complementary base sequence to the sequence of the DNA interest. Then we can use PCR in order to increase our uh, DNA. Then this is technique is mostly used to measure the transient uh, copy number in the transgenic mice or in the gene knockout or embryonic stem cells. So to create your gene knockout mice, your CRISPR, Cas9, all these technologies, we use this technology. Then comes northern blotting. Everything is same. It's just we use RNA in this case and we make sure that all the DNA is not present in it and we have a nice composition of our it's present. Yeah.
Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. I don't know why I was just got out of the meeting. Um, back I know uh, Google Meet, Zoom, all these uh, are not so good friendly, human friendly, I can say human friendly things. The YouTube is very easy, you just come in, you join the lecture, you can talk over the chat, lectures are delivered and you get the knowledge and they are being there for every time but this is, I know, this is a problem. I'm recording these lectures so don't worry. Even I was just kicked out. I don't know why. So Northern Rotting, it is used to study the expression patterns of the specific RNA molecules as a relative comparisons among two set of different samples of RNA. So RNA is separated based on size and then transferred to membrane then probed with the labeled component of a sequence of interest. And it is used to study uh, when and how much gene expression is occurring by measuring how much of that RNA is present in the different samples. And the Western is the same, it's done for the protein uh, with the help of SDS page that is sodium sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylate gel electrophoresis. So in this also we put our protein run over the gel and then transfer to the nitrocellulous membrane and then we probe with the antibodies, primary antibody and secondary antibody and then we see them with the help of chemiluminescence or R2 radiography and then our proteins are recognized. So I will show you about these virtual techniques with specific videos soon. Now next part is your molecular markers. Mm -hmm. So molecular markers are the based on naturally occurring polymorphism in DNA. Um, they are the genetic markers that are sequences of DNA which has been traced to specific location. Hi, um, yeah, Biswajit Swan. I don't know what's going on today. It's total catastrophe. So my voice is not coming right and video is not clear sometimes. Yeah, bache. Uh, what about others is the voice is clear and screen is being shared rightly how is the things at your end because YouTube streaming what happened there it was lagging five to ten minutes and it will it will keep going on like that and it will not make sense to continue there today I think the same thing is happening over here because of network issue Achha, Johnson they, it's fine with you okay what about others Because we have wasted around uh, 15 to 20 minutes today in just moving here and there and we couldn't concentrate on the topic. Okay, fine. So I will check 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. All is good. 
and then we will make this class extended for some more more minutes uh, 15 to 20 minutes more so that we can catch up the missed part today because of this glitches that we had today okay good so we continue yeah these molecular markers are very helpful actually so I will just uh, discuss them in nutshell so these are the following various markers uh, are present in the market that is RFLP, AFLP, RAPD, VNTRs, microsatellites, SNPs, STRs, SFP, RAD markers and so on. Yeah, so let's discuss one and what are the conditions that are characterized for the suitable molecular markers that they should be polymorphic, co-dominant inheritance and randomly frequently distributed throughout the genome and easy and cheap to detect and reproducible. The molecular markers can be used for several different applications including germplasm characterizations, genetic diagnostic, characterization of transformants, study of genome, organizations and phylogenetic uh, analysis and measure the genomic response to selection in a livestock. So RFLP, Distriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, they involves a fragmenting a sample of DNA by restriction enzymes so which can recognize and cut DNA wherever a specific short sequences occurs so a real FLP occurs when the length of a detected fragments varies between individuals and can be used in genetic analysis yeah and AFLP is on the other hand is the amplified fragment length polymorphism they are used to amplify the restriction fragments and reduce the complexity of the material to be analyzed on the other hand, RAPDs are the random amplifications of polymorphic DNA. So in them, we use a type of PCR actions to increase a DNA segment and then amplify them at the random way. Then there's a micro, these SSRs, micro satellite polymorphisms. They are the short random repeats uh, of sequence of one to six base pairs again and again, like ATCG, CT, ATCG, CT, and so on. Then there's a single nucleotide polymorphism, SNP. Uh, which is a, a sequence variations occurring when a single nucleotide that is your ATCG in the genome differs between members of species paired chromosome and an individual. So like from TA they got single nucleotide polymorphism to CG. So this will lead to lot of changes in your biomedical research, crops, livestock uh, bring a very good characteristics also by changing a single uh, nucleotide. Then there are short tandem repeats that is STRs in DNA when a short pattern of two or more nucleotides are repeated. So they are from 2 to 16 base pairs. For example, they are typically non-coding intron regions actually used in the forensic cases and for the genetic fingerprinting of individual. Now comes the last topic that is your uh, principle of uh, DNA isolation and purification. So DNA can be isolated from either nucleated cells or from the giant anionic cells. The basic principle is that first we lyse the cell, then we isolate the DNA and then we precipitate the DNA with the help of alcohol. Based on these three principles, your DNA isolation could be done either from plant cells or animal cells. Yeah. The sources that you can use for DNA could be blood, buccal cells, culture cells, bacteria, biopsies, forensic samples, so all could be used. So this is a routine procedure uh, which is done for isolation of DNA. First is your cell disruption, yeah. then is the isolation of DNA, then the precipitation of the DNA. So in the cell disruption, this is the most common method achieved by grinding or sonicating the sample and moving the membrane lipids by a detergent. So you can do the cell lysis with some enzymes, FABEG and protein degradation by protein ASK. And then you isolate the DNA by adding the protease. Yeah. Then afterwards, uh, you do the washing with the wash buffer. Then elute your DNA. And then you get the pure genomic DNA after the several centrifugation steps. So at the end, what you have to do is precipitate this DNA with the help of ethanol or isopropanol. So since DNA is insoluble in these alcohols, so it will aggregate together giving a pallet upon centrifugation and this steps also removes alcohol soluble salt. So the basic rules uh, that, that it takes 
is that first if you're taking from the blood you put uh, into a detergent like the triton x100 then you wash your cells to remove any restriction enzymes stock polymerase and you should do work on the ice always to slow down the enzymatic reactions always wear gloves to protect samples from any uh, contaminants and then autoclave your solutions your test tubes um, and keep all pallets and supranatins until you have the DNA that you are looking for then how to get the DNA so these are the various enzymes and chemicals that we use so cell lysis is done in the presence of sodium chloride which stabilizes and remain as a double helix so our DNA is negatively charged your both strands so NaCl is a positive and negative both so that's why it stabilizes it. The, the more you do add NaCl the more your DNA will be stabilized then EDTA is added which removes your magnesium ions and act as a cofactor of DNAs which chews up the DNA rapidly then we add detergent uh, like SDS which disrupt the lipid layers and help to dissolve these membranes and bind positive charges of the chromosomal proteins to release the DNA into the solution then we add protease uh, to digest the proteins so that protein could be removed uh, from the elevated temperature for 4 to 24 hours then to remove the protein properly you make organ solution organic solvent solution of phenol and chloroform in the ratio of 24 is to 1 so protein at the interference after centrifugation uh, at 10,000 rpm at 10 degrees celsius for 10 minutes you will see a layer of protein you can separate it out then then you precipitate this DNA with the help of ice cold 95% ethanol and leave it for 25 to minus 20 degrees Celsius overnight. Then you centrifugate the sample, then you will see the pallet as a DNA, and then you put into the 70% ethanol, then air dry. Then you resuspend in the sterile distilled water and store at the 4 degrees Celsius uh, at minus 20 degrees Celsius long term. Now, so and you can quantify this DNA afterwards by this formula um, optical we usually check this DNA at the 260 uh, spectrophotometry unit optical density and then we multiply by the dilution factor and how much uh, your DNA is present by, by multiply by 50 divided by 1000 so we have these nucleic acids have a peak absorbance in the ultraviolet range at about 260 nanometer if it is a double stranded DNA then we will see the concentration to be present at uh, 260 optical density unit to be 50 microgram per ml. If it is single standard DNA, it will be 33 microgram per ml. If it is RNA, it will be 40 microgram per ml. Then to check the DNA purity, then you also check beyond the two, uh, like we have discussed 260, you also check the optical density at 280. Then the ratio should come between 1.6 to 2. If it is coming less, then your protein is contamination is there. If it is uh, less than more than 2, then chloroform or phenol or contamination is there. So you need to repurify your sample. So in summary, what we have done is we have understood the sample for DNA extraction and the lysis of cells at the elevated temperature and detergents, enzymes and salt buffers and removal of cellular proteins and the precipitations of nucleic acids with ethanol then we quantify and purify this measurement of DNA. So that's it from the uh, perspective of PCR and isolation of DNA. Um, so we are almost done with this part. So I hope I had shared this, uh, these basics lectures with you. So don't worry students, you will have everything with you. Uh, yeah, introduction is there. So you can go through these lectures again uh, and there's there's a video recording also. If nothing is understanding, you can um, go through it. Okay, good. Now I will, I have already shared, bache. I already shared this uh, over the WhatsApp group, these presentations. Now I want to take you to the DNA isolation protocol.
Before beginning any protocol, you want to make sure that your workspace has a proper flow, uh, flow to avoid so contamination of samples or reagents. This example is set up for a right-handed student. Tips and pipe headers are on the left, racks and samples are in the middle, and the discard bucket is on the right. As your hand moves through the flow, it never unnecessarily crosses over the sample again. This video begins after students have spit into the DNA Genotech collection kits, capped the tubes to release the buffer, and mixed the solution by inversion. At this point, sample tubes should not be labeled to preserve student anonymity during the genotyping process. Using the P1000 micropipetter, 500 microliters is transferred from each spit collection tube into a new microcentrifuge tube. When pipetting large volumes, draw up the solution slowly to avoid bubbles or contaminating the micropipetter. Once the solution is transferred, close the spit tube lid and cap the sample. Repeat this process for all remaining samples. Prior to beginning this protocol, the heat block should be dialed to 50 degrees and turned on by flipping the switch. If it's heating, the light will glow red. Place samples in the heat block. This incubation must proceed for at least 90 minutes, but can also be left overnight. Tubes containing 20 microliters of DNA Genotech's proprietary purifying solution, prep it, will be provided. Once the samples have been incubated, you will transfer the entire volume to a tube containing the purifying solution. You may notice that the solution in the tube becomes cloudy. This is normal. Mix the solution with a vortex. To turn on the vortex, press the switch down to touch and turn the knob clockwise to ensure maximum speed. Hold one tube at a time and press the top of the black pad to initiate vibration. Repeat this process for all remaining samples. Embed all samples in ice for 10 minutes. Impurities in the solution will be removed by centrifugation. After flipping the switch in the back of the microcentrifuge, press the open button. Remove the metal lid inside by pulling on the knob.
make sure that the tubes are labeled either with letters or numbers before loading them into the centrifuge. Load samples with hinges facing outward. And balance the tubes across the rotor by ensuring that all tubes have equal volumes. Replace the metal lid and press it until it clicks securely onto the rotor. Close the lid to the micro centrifuge gently. Change the centrifugation time by pressing the arrows to the desired time, in this case, 5 minutes. Press the arrows by the speed to navigate to the proper RPM, in this case, 14.5 thousand RPM is the max the centrifuge can perform and is close enough to our desired speed. Press the start button. The centrifuge will begin to spin. It is suggested that you watch the centrifuge until it reaches maximum speed to ensure that there are no violent vibrations, which may mean that the tubes are unbalanced or the internal lid has come loose. If this occurs, press the stop button immediately. As the spin is going, Obtain four new tubes and label them. When the spin is complete, the lid to the centrifuge will pop open. Remove the internal lid and remove the samples gently to avoid disturbing the pellet. Place tubes of the same sample in line with each other to ease the transfer of the solution. After centrifugation, you should be able to see a white pellet that has collected on the bottom part of the tube on the side of the hinge. This pellet contains the impurities in the solution. The DNA is in the supernate. Using the P1000, transfer 400 microliters of supernatin, which contains the DNA, to the new tube. Place the tip on the opposite side of the tube from the pellet and draw up slowly to avoid disturbing it. Repeat this process for the remaining samples. Precipitate the DNA from solution by adding an equal volume of 100% ethanol to each sample and mix by inversion 10 times. The solution may become cloudy. This is normal. After incubating at room temperature for 5 minutes, 
Place the samples in the microcentrifuge with the hinges facing outward. Remember to balance your tubes. Spin the samples for two minutes. Remove the tubes from the centrifuge gently being mindful not to disturb the pellet which now contains your DNA. Visually inspect for a pellet at the bottom of the tube on the side of the hinge. A pellet is not always visible, so you can choose to centrifuge again or proceed as normal. In this example, a pellet is only seen in samples C and D, but all samples are carried through the process. Using a P1000, slowly remove and discard approximately 800 microliters of supernatant. Place the tip at the bottom of the tube on the opposite side of the pellet to avoid disturbing it. It is not important at this point that all solution is removed. Just get as much as possible. Expel the tip with the solution inside into the discard bucket. Repeat this process for all remaining samples. Visually inspect the tube to see if this pellet is still present. If it has gone missing, make a note of that. Clean the DNA pellet by adding 250 microliters of 70% ethanol to each sample. Do not mix the solution as it is imperative that the pellet is not disturbed. Repeat this process for all remaining samples. Place the samples in the centrifuge being mindful of balance and spin for two minutes. Remove the tubes from the centrifuge carefully.
In this step, the pellet still contains the DNA, and it is important to remove as much supernatant as possible without disturbing the pellet. So remove and discard the supernatant using the P200 for precision. This will take two or more draws. On the first draw, you can expel the solution into the discard bucket and use the same tip to draw up again, as long as the tip has not touched other surfaces. Repeat this process for the remaining samples. Lay out a few layers of Kim wipes. Open the tube and knock it onto the Kim wipe to remove any large volumes of solution still remaining. Leave the tube open and lay it on its side to evaporate any of the remaining solution from the pellet. Repeat this process for all remaining samples and allow them to air dry for 20 to 30 minutes. If the tube still has spots of solution or if the pellet does not look dry, allow for evaporation to continue. If the pellet looks dry, then resuspend the DNA using water. Add 100 microliters of molecular biology grade water directly onto the pellet side. Cap the tube and mix by vortexing for a few minutes. Visually inspect the tube to ensure that the pellet has disappeared or has gone back into solution. If it has not, then continue to vortex or allow the tube to sit at room temperature before proceeding to subsequent steps. Repeat this for all remaining samples. So, aber DNA Isolation
okay so what what i didn't get you students but now i had shared with you everything so we are done from this perspective of um, basics of a molecular biology now we will discuss some more concept let's take a five minutes break and then we continue so it's 12 50. Uh, does anyone of you have a class of vaccine technology at 1 pm if it is so then we will stop our class by then if no, if no one has a class at at 1 pm then we will continue what about others So if anyone has, just let me know, otherwise we continue. Okay, then we continue. Let's take just a need five minutes break at 12.55 we meet and then we continue further. PCR is done, structure of DNA is done, basics of uh, nucleic acids, nucleotides, transcription, translation, tools of microbiology. Um, we had covered a quite number of topics today.
okay we can start So this DNA replication I had discussed earlier the basically with you very basics of DNA replication. Now we will go along some detail about DNA replication here. That is how it is semi-conservative in nature and we will discuss its mechanism. We will discuss about initiation of replication, elongation of DNA polymerase, what are the various DNA polymerase that we used and telomerases. So basically this is the central dogma of life where you have your DNA uh, which could go self-replication could happen to it and this self-replication of DNA uh, means making more copies of DNA which is a semi-conservative mechanism produce, producing identical two daughter DNA molecules. So it's giving a two identical daughter DNA molecules from its parent DNA. And then it go to mRNA. mRNA could also go reverse uh, with the help of reverse transcription. Yeah, then after mRNA in the nucleus, it goes out uh, into the cytoplasm and with the help of translation, a protein is produced. So how it is a semi-conservative um, replication? Just a second. So here we have parent cell yeah, and then the DNA replicates from single chromosomes and then giving rise to two daughter cells. <coughs> this is original helix and then DNA helix is one round of replication. So in the two strands of parent molecules they are separated and each can serve as a template for the application of new complementary strand. So this produces two daughter molecules. In each of the daughter molecule, one parent strand and newly synthesized strand is there. So that's why it's known as uh, semi-conservative replication. So you can see there's a blue, uh, the both blue parts of this DNA are being transferred to the both daughter uh, DNA with each strand having blue one and the new synthesis of DNA is being done here with this yellow one. So 1958, Matthew Meselson and Frank Stahl, Meselson and Stahl experiment basically, they did this equilibrium density gradient centrifugation test. So in which what they did is they get these two different DNAs uh, in six miller uh, your cesium chloride, then they centrifuge for 50 to 60 hours at 100,000 G, which results in the uh, generation of gradients of cesium chloride and bending of DNA. So in this they have added uh, two isotopes coded DNA, one is coded with 14N, another is with 50N. So with increasing density they got separated. So that was the basic experiment they did. Then they discovered what's the reason behind it. So initially uh, to start the experiment they what they did, uh, they have this 15N containing medium, this pinkish color and in, into the cesium chloride gradient <coughs> then what they did they what they found is from the dna bands and the densitometric scans that most of them they were of the 50 and 50 n dna the both strands belong to 50 n and 50 n dna then they're continuing growing this first generation in 14 n media so they've added 
this uh, 15 and media uh, DNA into the 14 and media and then replication is done then after the replication was over they were again put into this gradient and what they discovered that the the gradient that they had the bending the the bonding the bands the densimetric scan it was showing mainly the combination of your both 15n and 14n hybrid yeah it has in both hybrids so then they let it grow again continue growing so they got after the hybrid was produced so they started to give two different um, gradients one for 14n one for 15n together so what they discovered that there was one with the light 14 and 14 n and there was one with the heavy and light both together that was the hybrid and then they again did this replication four time and that they discovered that the from 14 and 14 n they discovered the light but from this one they again find out one was again like the other uppercase one was a light and one was the hybrid and this cycle keeps going on if you keep replicating so this will give again both uh, light and light light and light light and light and this will give one light and one hybrid so this shows that the, these experiments that the dna that they had was a semi conservative in nature so what we have seen is that after the one band is seen but in the middle of the tube indicates the both dna synthesized and hybrid molecules so after the second generation two bands seen one in the middle one in the top indicates half of the DNA is light half is hybrid DNA and after the third generation what they can see is 70% of DNA is light and 25% of DNA is hybrid DNA and so on so this is your starting DNA heavy DNA and this is first generation all heavy and light yeah and then this is the second generation two heavy uh, light to heavy light the same thing that we have discussed it's keep going uh, on same way it's the same experiments so in 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 principle this dna replication in eukaryotes so just want to check if all is fine okay good good so mainly the dna replication in eukaryotes it's happening during the chromosomal your DNA replicate during the S phase of the uh, cell cycle. So there is G2 phase, cell growth, interface phase, then there is mitosis, cytokinesis, and then there is cell growth phase G1, and there is interface. And during this interface, mainly your uh, synthesis phase, that is, um, your replication is done. Yeah. So basically in the DNA replication, uh, it makes a copy of itself. That's the basic definition of your DNA replication. It's a process by which DNA makes a copy of itself. So it has many steps uh, in, in, in principle. Many steps are included in that. So first step is to unzip the double helix structure, which is done with the help of helicase enzyme. So first is the unzipping. Yeah, unzipping with the help of helicase enzyme. So this is our, if this is our DNA. Right. So this DNA will have origin of replication or eyesight. It will have an or eyesight which will let the with the help of helicase enzyme it will let it be open and make a like a bubble here so on yeah. 
so this one is known as your replication bubble this one is known as your replication bubble and then after the replication bubble is is being made then our replication fork is made Yeah, I really need to buy a pen, pen tab. I'm using my mouse just to draw all these. Uh, this this will be your replication fork. And then after the replication fork is made, then um, complementary strands act as a template. So you will have your strands. Let's say A, T, C. G, so it will produce T, A, G, C. So, yeah, so it will produce two two strands actually. One will be the leading strand, the leading strand, and other will be the lagging strand, lagging strand. Yeah, the leading strand uh, will move towards the replication fork that is 3 prime to 5 prime end whereas the lagging strand will move from 5 prime to 3 prime end so that means leading strand it will have the replication will continue against the strand where in the lagging strand it will be a this this will be continuous this will be continuous and this will be discontinuous lagging strand why uh, because it will produce okazaki fragments as we have discussed earlier right so this is how the basics uh, of your dna replication will occur and beyond that uh, if we see from the diagrammatic presentation uh, enzymatic uh, so we have these DNAs yeah all replicated together so what will happen uh, here helicase yeah I will write the short forms here so that you can remember so you will have helicase enzyme present here it will unwind that your whole DNA right and and then at the this if this is your 5 prime end and this is 3 prime end uh, these are your parental strands parent strands and this is 3 prime end and this is 5 prime end so basically um, your primase first here your primase enzyme will attach a primer here your primase enzyme will attach a primer here which will make the reaction start adjusted to the new template with the help of primer it will produce in a primase and it will eventually grow up with the help of your DNA polymerase 3 here will be your DNA polymerase 3 this is very legendary picture is being made I know that um, DNA polymerase 3 so what is it doing is it's it's adding nucleotides at the 3 prime end so this DNA polymerase is started to add these nucleotides from the DNA polymerase and here you're also as I discussed SSB proteins single standard base proteins they will make this uh, these nucleotides to be unstable your SSB proteins Okay. and this will be your leading strand this will be your leading strand this one okay and then this bottom one will be your lagging strand which will has DNA polymerase 1 which will be producing your strands uh, complementary to that DNA polymerase 1 but there will be some gaps later on right and in order to start this reaction so like here we have this primer and primase so they will also come here and will 
start producing the reaction and this fragment will be called as Okazaki fragments these fragments will be called as Okazaki fragments and this will be your lagging strand this will be your lagging strand right and further to make this reaction go on your DNA polymerase 3 will also work here like in uppercase DNA polymerase 3 will also work here mm -hmm. so in order to remove any primer uh, which is not required we can use exonucleus here yeah and ligase is also used in order to join the nucleotides uh, the backbone of the fragment so here the DNA ligase could be joined between the two different atoms yeah so replication always occurs from the 5 prime to 3 prime direction so whatever the replication that we were discussing so here this strand will be from 5 prime to 3 prime end and this one is also 5 prime to 3 prime end so the replication in this case will go from top to this and in this case from go top to this I know this this is somehow but this is I just wanted to give you a touch that in reality how the DNA replication is working in real sense what my slide is blank now it was blank before now it is filled So in this DNA replication, it's a process by which DNA makes a copy of itself during the cell division. So in the first step, it's unzip uh, with the helical structure and then it's carried out by an enzyme called helicase which breaks the hydrogen bonds and uh, of DNA with A and T and C and G, they break it out. Then the separation of two single strand of DNA creates a Y shape called replication fork, uh, which acts as a template for the new strands of DNA and one of the strand is oriented 3 to 5 prime direction and this is called as leading strand our other strand is 5 to 3 prime directions away from the replication fork this is known as your lagging strand so as a result of the different orientations two standards of replicated differentially so then leading strand it is a short piece of RNA called primer will be add produced by enzyme called primase it will come and join it and start producing your leading strand and DNA polymerase will start giving your nucleotides A, C, G, T as per the corresponding direction. So this sort of replication will be continuous. Whereas in the lagging strand, numerous RNA primers are made by primase enzymes bind at various points of the lagging strand. And it leads to production of chunks of DNA called as Okazaki fragments. And then added to the lagging strand to the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So this type of replication is called as discontinuous as Okazaki fragments will need to join up later right um, further the new strands will be proof free to make sure no mistakes are done finally enzyme DNA ligase will join these two bands and the result DNA replication is of two DNA molecules consisting of one new and one old chain of nucleotides so following the replication new DNA automatically winds up into the double helix yeah so these are the molecules that we required like nucleotides, templates, RNA primers, enzymes like helicase, primase, DNA polymerase, topoisomerase, ligase, oricite, uh, single standard binding proteins and so on. Yeah, I think this will be uh, enough from the perspective of uh, DNA synthesis. Um, I can go wider to this but this will be um, too much um, from the perspective of DNA replication. So we can stop it here now. Yeah. Um, then we see us tomorrow at 1 p.m. or 11, sorry, 11 a.m. and continue till. Uh, 1 p.m. I hope so tomorrow internet will be fine and we continue further then yeah so I will share these this presentation with you um